Hello, good evening, welcome to Hook Knoll in Nottingham for this week's Hockey Chat with me, John O'Bullard. Um, I'm sure you can guess what the main topic of conversation might be about tonight. Of course, it's going to be about the adopts reviews uh, that came out earlier today. Um, we will cover them first. Had an awful lot of comments and questions about that, so I'm going to lump it all together. Uh, what I will say for all of you who are joining early on, if you could just tweet out the link for this so we can get as many people in here as possible to add to the discussion, that would be very, very much appreciated. As I just tweet it away from a couple of places, put that away. Uh, if you've got any questions to add uh you've got the chat box there so you can pop anything in any discussions for from what we are uh discussing uh throughout tonight you just pop it in the chat box and we'll get around to it so it could be a long one tonight because there's there's uh obviously well, i think one two three four five six seven there's seven comments regarding the um uh the dops review and then we've got a few other bits as well. So uh, uh, we will start with the dops. Uh, what I will say uh, before we get started is uh, if you can also contact me on Twitter at John O'Bullard, if you want to give me a follow, if you don't already, that would be much appreciated. Um, and you can pop questions in, in there. The late ones come in, so I, I will get to them as quickly as possible. Okay, so uh, dots earlier today. So just view Justin Harmonic of Coventry uh, got two games for interference after a hit on Josh Waller. Mark Lewis of Cardiff Devils, um, he got one game for boarding for a hit on Matthew Thompson of the Coventry Blaze. Um, a lot of controversy around this because. Uh, I'll give my personal opinion. Having viewed them, I don't think either was ban worthy. To be perfectly honest, uh, having having watched them, and also that you could get a question of consistency as well, because there was a big outcry when Lyndon Springer uh, laid a hit on Martin Latar of the Sheffield Steelers on the second of October, um, which is very similar to, to one of these hits as well, and nothing was given for that. So. Is there a consistency issue? But let me, let me just run through some of the comments that, that I've had today and, and, and questions. So first from Ollie Patchin, who is a Steelers fan, says, Dops need to be restructured, restructured and improved ASAP. Do you agree? In general, it's just the inconsistency, lack of bans for similar offences, or in some cases could argue worse. Today's bans of Harmonic and Lewis make no sense. The Lewis hit was a far more dangerous late hit and then received one game, yet Harmonic two games for an argument arguably good hit. Eric Holland, who I believe is also a Steelers fan, he says, is Dops fit for purpose? And he follows that on with, can hockey in the UK survive if we take the physical element out of the game? Uh, Stuart Easterby, who is a Blaze fan, few from Blaze fans, uh, as you can imagine. I would like to know your thoughts on the recent Dops decisions, particularly surrounding the Coventry Blaze. Uh, Dan Jagger, another Blaze fan, says, Harmonic ban worthy of two games? Was it worthy of more games than the Lewis hit? Uh, and Marco Doherty says, Dops, just Dops. Absolutely shocking. Uh, and then I've had another uh, one for, uh, which uh, came to me via a message uh, from David Spence. He says, High number of elite league fans cry blue murder for anything resembling physical contact and clamoring for bans for the most trivial matches. Uh, for matters, sorry, but then bitch and moan when bands get handed out for the most trivial matters. Can't have it both ways. I suppose there's some truth in that. Um, you do see a clamouring uh, for bands for sometimes the most innocuous of hits, but let's bring it all together anyway. So, DOPS. Is DOPS fit for purpose? It should be, but it is the Department of Player Safety. The clue is in the name. Are players being protected? I think, well, from last week when I discussed the, the shenanigans that went on after the Blaze and Guildford game, I do think that most of those bans were, were pretty much okay. I mentioned that the, the Bolton ban, um, the guy from Guildford, I think I thought two games could possibly have been more. Um, but apart from that, I think they got got that pretty spot on. I think today they've got it completely and utterly wrong. 
Um, starting with the harmonic hit on Josh Waller. Um, the harmonic is lining him up for the hit. And Waller misses the puck, so it doesn't make the pass. Harmonic, harmonic has then has a split second to pull out of that hit. And, and one of the things in the Dops uh, uh, review was that he could have ch- he should have changed his mind. Well, he had no time to change his mind, as far as I'm concerned. And he makes the hit. And to be fair, it's a clean hit. Uh, it's shoulder to shoulder. But because Waller's not expecting it, I think that's what causes the injury and sends him flying into the board. For me, not a ban, not a bannable offence at all. And I, I know Josh Waller got injured from it, but you cannot put any blame on Justin Harmonic for that, for not pulling out. He had a fraction of a second to make a decision because he expected Waller to take the puck. If Waller gets the puck, he's lined him up for the hit. Well, he lined him up for the hit anyway, and Waller misses the puck. What is Harmonic supposed to do? (laughs) Then looking at the uh, Mark Lewis ban for the hit on Matthew Thompson, again, I didn't think it was that bad. I think it was made to look worse by the way that Thompson went into the boards and flew up, which, which, which did look quite, quite bad. But it looked worse far worse than the uh, harmonic hit, yet it got less of a ban. And I I just want to know, or I'd just like to know, why Dops thought that was worthy of less of a ban than the harmonic hit, and also why they think both were worthy of bans when the Lyndon Springer hit on Martin Latell that I mentioned from earlier in the season had no ban. Not that I thought that should have had a ban either, because I thought that was a it was just late. And I think the only thing you could go on, on both of these is that they was late. So they should have been penalties, rightly so, on the night on the ice. Game penalties, mm, arguable. Bans, not for me. Not for me at all. And that brings us back to Eric's point where Eric Holland said, can hockey in the UK survive if we take the physical element out of the game? I don't think hockey anywhere could survive if we take the physical element out um, because, because it's a selling point of the game. A lot of people go for the physicality. They go for the contact. They go to watch the contact. They go to watch the hits. You take that away and you have a very different game. Uh, and one that I think a lot of people wouldn't want to go to, frank, quite frankly. Oh, Dan's on, and he says, they also said harmonics hit was high. No, it wasn't. It was shoulder to shoulder. There was no way that was high at all. He didn't leave his feet. He was, he was lined up now. I, 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 I forgot about that, actually. So thanks for pointing that out, Dan. Yeah, I did disagree with that completely. Um. And then this this sort of brings us on to DOPS overall. And a lot of people are saying, is it fit for purpose? I I think it's fit for purpose. I think it's a difficult job. I just think some of their decisions do be belief and, and there is has to be questions around the consistency as well. Um especially regarding these two incidents from, from Sunday night. So that needs to be looked at. Department of Player Safety, as I said, clue is in the name. Are they looking after players' safety? Also, another thing I'd like to know, which I'm not sure of, is every game reviewed? Um, I suppose that's difficult when you have games on a Friday and then a Saturday or a Saturday and then a Sunday. Have you got time to review them? But I believe that there is some sort of uh, Toronto type thing like there is in the NHL where there is, uh, whether it's Mike Hicks or someone else or or a group of people are looking at feeds of the games as they happen. Um, I believe that that is what's happening. If anybody knows for sure, please do let me know. But but like I say, I believe that is what goes on. So so these things are being looked at in in real time and, and live which is a good thing, I think, if it is. Um, but also, are the games reviewed individually afterwards to look for, for, for instance, where player safety is is on the line? But is it really looking after player safety? Has there been a crackdown where there's been 
an edict that hits need to be looked at more. I don't know, honestly, but that sort of thing isn't communicated out generally. I would I would just like to know if one, if there has been a memo released the same that hits need to be looked at. Two, is every game reviewed? Because uh, I think that's really important. And three, is DOPS really serving its purpose over player safety? Uh, who decides what incidents to view? I would think, Andrew, that would come down overall to Mike Hicks uh, as the as the head of referees or the head of officiating operation, whatever title he has. I think he he has. Um, is is there a panel that looks at these decisions anymore? Is it sent? Uh, overseas, like it was before, we don't know, and I think it would be nice if they had, if they gave some of that communication or some of that information to the fans, so at least we know what is happening. Just a little bit more transparency would be really good on on some of these things. I think there needs to be a DOPS, there needs to be a, a Department of Player Safety, um, but after the decision that came out this morning. Does it need to be looked at and does it need to be restructured? Possibly so. Uh, and also give us the information and let us know how things are looked at, on what time scale they're looked at, who looks at them. Because, because uh, I think that, trend, uh, that, that sort of transparency will go a long way, a long way to, to getting more fans on side with regards to DOPS. Angus says they have the ability to slow things right down and scrutinise, but are not taking into account the players have little time to change their minds in the moment. The people doing it, refs, ex-players. I like to say, I think Mike Hicks is involved, who is obviously next ref, but, but aside from that, I, I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, and that was inter another interesting thing, actually, Angus. The, the, I, while I was thinking while I was watching the videos this morning, is they showed the sort of slow motion replays, but only showed it in real time, I think, once on each video. Uh, and you're absolutely right. The, when you slow it down, it looks like an age. But in real time, it, it's literally a fraction of a second. And I, I think that's the problem. But I, I do think the Justin Harmonic one is incredibly harsh. I think the Lewis one is harsh, but not as harsh as the Harmonic one. Um so that I mean that that's that's where I stand on DOPS. So I think there's a definite need for it, but I think there has to be some some consistency, uh, and I think there has to be a bit more transparency about how decisions are being reached. Um, because I don't think they've covered themselves in glory. I think they've done themselves a lot of damage today, quite frankly, and probably got themselves a lot of opposition, um, which you don't want. You want you want to be working with DOPS. What happened to the videos that Seth Brennan used to produce? They're produced by Luke, Luke Fisher, Fisher. I believe it's Luke Fisher doing the voiceover. So they're done. The videos are, are done exactly the same. Um, are they being more strict with shorter benches? Possibly. Possibly. Yeah, we'll, we'll come on to, on to shorter benches a little later. But, yeah, so, so let, let, us, let us know what you, what you think. I, I, there's no real definitive answer to this. But like I say, I think you have to have a, a DOPS or a system of, of player safety in place. But consistency and transparency are the key words here for me. Uh, others may disagree and others may think differently. But yeah, that that's uh, today has not been a good day for DOPS at all, has it? Let, let's be perfectly honest. Um, we'll move on because uh, we've got lots and lots of other questions to get through. Um, so Angus Wilson, who is a Panthers fan and is on at the minute, uh, for as you can see from the comments, he says, listening to the newest Panthers podcast show, and they mentioned there is a salary cap. Is this true? When was it announced? Or were, were they referring to the COVID cup salary thing? Um, and Angus's questions, uh, question did get some replies from Jonathan Cato, who I believe is a Steelers fan. And he's saying he's been heard it mentioned about a, a wage cap. I've certainly seen it mentioned, uh, but there's been nothing official. And again, this comes to the to the transparency and the communication. If there's a salary cap, why haven't they let fans know about it? It would make sense considering that the reduction in the um, 
in the bench sizes. Um, but the, if there is a salary cap, you can see there's some teams that have what you would consider on paper a lot better rosters than others, which you would then consider them being expensive. I, I'd look at Belfast and Sheffield in that respect, who I think looking at the, the quality of players and the pedigree of players that they have would, would likely be more expensive than anybody else. Obviously, we are not going to know that uh, because we don't know what play, pay, players' wages are, and nor should we, in my opinion. But you know, is there a cap? What is it and what are the rules around it? Because there was other, uh, what Jonathan was saying on Twitter was, does the injured reserve mean that the wages are then withheld? Is that why you're putting players on the injured reserve? Because in the NHL, um, injured reserve salary doesn't count towards the cap. So is this the same in the EIHL if there is a cap? But we don't know if there is definitely a cap, but it has been mentioned. So, And this is the thing, just... That little bit more transparency and communication from from the league would make fans a lot happier. That is that is something that should be. If if there is a wage cap, that is something that should be communicated and publicised on the Elite League website. As far as I'm concerned, because I think fans have a right to know about that. To be perfectly honest, um, so to actually answer the, the question, uh, I don't know if it's true, Angus. Uh, it's clearly not been announced, uh, but I don't think they are referring to the COVID Cup salary. Salary. Um, it is, I think, referring to a wage cap for this season, but nothing has been communicated on that score so far. So we will see if anything comes out. He said, oh, "What's that? I understand. Every, not every fan is interested in the info, but I think there's plenty of interest in this info. I would agree, even if you didn't tell us each place into wage or just put, put us, them into wage bands. I don't even think that's necessary. I don't. I I don't really care what pay players earn. I don't want to know what players earn. I wouldn't want people. I wouldn't want public knowledge of what I earn or what I can can pick up." On, on the various things I do, I don't. I don't think that's fair, and I don't think it's right that that information should be out there. In my opinion, there's no point having a wage cap because teams will always find a loophole. Could not agree more, Andrew. Could not agree more. Um, whenever there's been wage caps in the past, there's always been ways around it, and people have always found ways around it, and and that's gone on for time. Time way going back. I mean, I remember when it was the Super League. There was always ways around the wage cap, and and people will find ways to ways to get around it. And that's why I don't think that they work. So uh, mm, there we go. <laughs> Cock off Tampa Bay. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, move on. Uh, just something come in from Bob Mitchell King on Twitter. Uh, no mention of a Toronto centre, nor who actually sits on DOP. So he's posted a link to the Elite League from the Elite League website. So we shall see. Um, Andrew Williamson, cars, college courses, houses. Yeah, absolutely. They, they all count. Um, um, employing players, wives was, was a, or, and girlfriends was another good one, a way of getting around it. Uh, <laughs> So it's another one. Okay, uh, a couple of questions coming in about about under twenties. Um, so the first one from Mark Rackham, who co-hosts hockey from across the pond with Caitlin Berry of Premier Sports. So do go and check that podcast out; it is excellent. Um, and Mark says an exciting roster for GB under twenty has been announced. Most of the players are playing overseas right now. Are we relying on the import rule to be changed? See any of them play in the Elite League anytime soon? Alex Graham. Uh, being the prime example, so Alex Graham was in the OHL. He's come back uh, and is on the two-way between the Sheffield Steelers and the Sheffield Steel Dogs. Uh, and then uh, one from Elite Prospects UK, who is Mara Reynolds. So Mara runs Elite Prospects UK, puts all the information on there, does an absolutely incredible job getting all the stats for all the players and keeping that site up to date. Um, so do show your appreciation by giving Elite Prospects UK a follow on Twitter. Uh, absolutely amazing job. 
Um, Amara says most elite league clubs are bringing in talented under 20s at what feels like a higher rate than previous years. Is this purely as defiance against the bench import rules or is it a genuine drive to develop these players for pro hockey? Um, this is this is how I see it at the moment. And, and I think this has been very interesting so far. And things have happened that I, I didn't expect to happen. Um, so talking from a Panthers point of view, I was very surprised to see uh, earlier in the season before he went in on injured reserve, Morgan Clark Pizzo, icing for the Panthers when Peterborough had a game the same night. And the same has happened with Jack Hopkins, who is on a two-way with Telford, but he's been icing with Panthers. So clearly Panthers, whereas in the past the uh, National League or NIHL team seemed to have the call over those players, it now seems that the Elite League team now has the call over those players, which is great for me. And they've been getting ice time as well. And I think... Some, something strange has happened that I didn't expect to happen where we're seeing Brits, more Brits coming in because of the limited roster. So as teams pick up injuries, they're replacing, seem to be replacing with Brits, which is great, which is absolutely great to see. And they're getting the opportunities and they're getting the ice time. Still a lot of work to do on, on netminders. Um, I think that is an area where there could be a big problem. In, in later years because we don't seem to be bringing through any netminders to the quality and standard standard of the likes of Ben Bounds or Jackson Whistle. Um, there's a lot of talent in the netminding pool, but they're just not getting the ice time or they're just not getting the starts at elite league level in order to, to build and get better and get to that standard. And, and I think that is a worry. But I think for skaters... Um, it's actually gone quite well this year, um, which surprised me because I didn't expect it to. What 14 imports and five Brits, 19 man rosters uh, at the start of the season. But as injuries have come in, they need the teams have needed bodies, and um, those bodies have been provided by British players. And long may that continue. Um, to go back to Mark's point, I do think that there probably does need to be a reduction in the import level, not massively, but gradually. It's 14 at the minute, and I thought that was too high after the the Elite Series showed us that you could put good teams out with just eight imports. I think eight, eight is too low at this point. I think 14 is too high. I think the happy medium I would look to get to is 10, but you have to do it gradually. I'll be very disappointed if it's still 14 imports next season, especially if they're still going with the 19-man rosters. Um, because Great Britain are in pool eight of the World Championships with a mainly British-trained, British-born playing nationals, but not many. It is mainly British-trained. How do you expect the talent to come through and replace them if you're not playing them in the top league in this country? And, and as Mark says, a lot of the players in the under-20 squad have um, are playing abroad, uh, mainly in North America. I think all of them in North America are in the squad. Um, so you know, they may want, want to stay in North America and play in that standard or, or, or stay out. You've certainly got a, a Cade Nielsen, for example, uh, who will be playing NCAA next season. Liam Steele as well, who who was trained. He, um, I think he's got an NCAA berth for next season as well. So, you know, great. We're getting these British trained players playing in really good quality leagues in North America. And that's what we want. And that's what will put them in the shop window. And that's what will get more and more uh, British trained players to compete for any for, for NHL draft places uh, and follow the lead of uh, Liam Kirk. So what Mark say there, I really hope everyone can tune in to watch the GB under 20 compete in December. It might nice if free sports picked it up. I think it's certain Liam Steele will turn a few heads. Yeah, it'd be great if, if uh, I mean, I, I know under 20s have been on uh, free sports, I think the last three because I I was out there covering them for free sports. So uh, uh, it'd be nice if uh, 
if we could get out there again, because at least in, in Romania this time. So, yeah, uh, another country I've not been to, not that, not that I'm uh, hinting or anything. But, yeah, I, 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 I really do cover, love covering the GB uh, under-20, under-18s and women's squad. So it would be nice if, if we could get out there and cover it. Uh, and, of course, it increases that exposure as well. Uh, I don't know anything. Uh, I don't know even if it has been put forward. I really, really hope it has. Yeah, because I think they deserve to be on free sports, on premier sports, or certainly on a on a broadcaster. And let's be fair, free sports and premier sports have done that. They have shown Great Britain at all levels, at under 18, at under 20, at women's and at senior level. So you cannot knock free sports or premier sports for the support they have given because pr prior to them, we never saw them on television, and now we are regularly, and, and long, long may it continue, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, let's crack on, because, um, like I say, still a few a few more to go through. Martin Andrews, who is a Steelers fan, he says, do you think the reduction in game day squads from previous seasons is going to impact the growth of the game? I had something around this um, last week. I don't think it will imp impact the growth of the game, but what I think it will do is it does give a danger, and we're seeing it with some teams uh, of injuries causing big, big problems. Then do you have a problem with quality? Because teams have to shorten their bench. Um, yes, they can bring, bring British players in to replace, replace imports and etc., but... Does that have an impact on, on, on the quality overall? Um, is it going to impact the growth? At the moment, I'm going to say no for the reason I gave in the previous answer, that there seems to be a lot more British players giving an, being given an opportunity at a nice time because uh, they're coming in to cover injured players, which, which is good. Once those players get fit again or once everything gets used, used to and everything's up to speed, will that change? We're going to have to wait and see. Um, so at the moment, no, I don't think it will impact the growth of the game. And I think I would hopefully think that this is a one season thing and next season we'd look at a minimum bank strength of, of 20 so we can have four lines, hopefully. Um, but we are we are going to have to wait and see on, on that one. Um, but at the moment, no, to, to answer your question, with, with my opinion, I don't think it will impact the growth of the game. But that could change depending on how the season pans out and also what the rules will be for the season as well, I think. Next uh, one comes from Colin Lundy, who is a Fife fan, and his question is regarding Fife. He says, have Fife really bought back Chase Shaber without him being double vaxxed? If so, is this the most amateur thing you've seen in pro hockey? Um, just to give some context behind this, uh, the Elite League requires all players to to be have a double vaccination before they can play in the league, um, and and that applies to to all imports as well. Obviously, um, Chase Shaber was announced be as being signed by Fife. I think it was the thirteenth of October, and he had not appeared for them. Uh, in their in the webcast of Belfast and Fife at the weekend, uh, Simon Kitchen, who is the uh, Belfast commentator, mentioned that the that he'd seen rumours that Shaber hadn't come over yet because um, he's not had a double vaccination. So, um, but obviously, there's nothing come out about that from the Fife Flyers. So you have to ask. What was research done by the Flyers? If this is true, remember, this is just rumours. So take it as rumours. It it might not be true. Uh, and there may be other reasons why Chase Shaber isn't in the country. But uh, if, if that is the case, and I say big if, because we don't know for certain, then it, it's not a good look for the five Flyers because it looks like they've not done their research, if that is the case. And, and that's where I'll leave that one at the moment. Uh, Reese Williams, he says, are Panthers right to be taking their time with signing injury replacements since we 
since we've got players like Hansen, Tal and Talbot in 1920 by doing just that. At the same time, though, the points drop well short could be costly. Uh, lots of injuries for the Panthers at the minute, down to 10 imports uh, with uh, Robbie Belligeron getting uh, being pulled out of the lineup after warm up before the Cardiff game on Saturday. And then Kevin Deming getting horrendous injury in that game as well, uh, where he was cut at the back of the leg by skate blade, a 15 centimetre cut apparently. So that is still being assessed. So we don't know how, how long he may be out for, uh, which is a worry. And that adds to the other injuries we've got at the minute with Steve Lee, quality British defenseman, big, big miss. He's out. Uh, Morgan Clark Pizzo uh, should be returning from injury reserve now. Uh, and then uh, Karotsa as well, who is out injured. So I think we're down to 10. We have 13 imports. Um, and you know, three injured, so we're down to 10. And yeah, Which is, in one way, it gives the likes of Clark Pizzo when he comes back and Jack Hopkins the opportunity to ice for the Panthers. But... Obviously, with the benches being limited, it means you're playing short, which then risks injuries for, for the rest of the roster. Um, so we need some bodies. And we quickly. But I've heard from other coaches and other teams that the, the player market is incredibly dry at the minute and it's very, very difficult to get some players in. Um, the thing with Panthers is they have... Guillaume Doucet and Tim Wallace. Tim Wallace is head coach, Guillaume Doucet as, as director of hockey, hockey operations. Both decent players, both still in, in their sort of early to mid-30s, both could ice for me. Obviously, you may have an issue with match fitness, which is understandable, but if Panthers need quick bodies, surely there's your answer. There's two bodies that could come in immediately. And only to cover injured reserve, but surely it's something that needs to be looked at. Um, as for getting players in, if if we could get some British players in from from the national league, go for it. Just get get some players in because the squad is looking starting to look a bit threadbare at the minute. And I see what you're saying by waiting and you're getting the likes of Hanson and Talbot as we did in, in the 1920 season. Um, I think at the minute we, we are desperate for bodies and we need, need to get some players quickly before the weekend because we've got another important league game against Dundee at home on Saturday. Then we've got the cup games, which we've already quali qualified for. I think we've got three cup games then, which to be perfectly honest, as I've said a lot of times, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to uh, bang on about it, but for me, the Challenge Cup is a complete waste of time at the minute with the great group stages. So... Quite frankly, we could just ice Will Curling for those and nobody else. And I, I, I wouldn't be bothered because they're a bit pointless, those games at the minute. I'm, I'm not going to lie. So there we go. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think we need we need some injury replacements. PDQ, uh, as far as I'm concerned, Reese. Uh, Cameron Wynne Jones asks, should Panthers have a full-time bench coach assisting Tim Wallace? Is a player assistant coach enough? Yeah, I think so. You, if you think about it, most of the coaching and most of the assessment is going to be done in training sessions. Um, Tim Wallace isn't playing. He's a full-time bench coach. Uh, Mark Matheson is the assistant coach. He'll sort of be his eyes and ears on the ice. I don't think we need a full-time bench coach assisting Tim. I, th I think he, he's more more than enough got this uh, with Panthers a second in the league at the moment. OK, still very early days, but they seem to be doing OK. And the other thing that, that's also not, not brought up is you've got Adam Goodridge, who is the equipment manager on the bench, who has also done that bench, man, uh, bench uh, coaching job when Corey Nielsen was playing uh, so a while ago. So there's some experience there to call on as well. So, to be honest, no, I, I think I think we're nicely covered with the uh, with the coaching on the Panthers bench. Quite frankly, Karen. But you know, if, if you agree or disagree, let me know. Uh, Colin has replied on Twitter, and he says Shaber is in the country. They picked him up in Manchester when we went and got beat five 0 and then beat them eight 0 the following night. So Shaber is here. So then that adds to the mystery as why he's not playing. 
unless he's not match fit or he's carrying an injury or like we said he vaccines but i guess i guess we won't find that one out to be perfectly honest final question so if you've got any more questions for discussion uh, just pop them in the chat and i will get to them uh, and this one comes from Rita Hughes. Uh, not sure who she supports, but I am going to assume she's a Panthers fan from, from the question, she says, which is, are Sheffield worryingly obsessed with Nottingham after their tweet on Friday night? For, so for those that don't know, uh, the Steelers played Manchester in a cup game and Panthers played Belfast in the live primary, primary, uh, Premier Sports game, get my teeth back in, uh, where they were quite... Uh, Systematically beaten by the Belfast Giants, who were excellent. Um, yes, Panthers were poor, but I think that's very, very unfair on Belfast, who I thought were, were absolutely superb on Friday night. And I thought uh, Scott Conway had a magnificent game for them as well. Uh, easily the best team I've seen in Nottingham this season so far. Very, very good. And, and they were a joy to watch them. Their plays were a joy to watch at times. Um, but to go back to the question that Rita, Rita says, for those that don't know, um, Sheffield tweeted uh, a screen grab of the result from the Elite League website and just put on it in other news uh, with the Nottingham score. Um, lapped up by some of their fans, not so much lapped up by others. I, I found it pretty hilarious because even after a great result for them in Manchester where they came back from two goals down twice to win 7-4, they still, still had to put something out that we'd lost 5-0. And I just thought <laughs> I just thought it was funny because it does show a, an obsession with Nottingham, quite frankly, um, especially after their own great victory. But I think we all know who's probably behind that. Um, but the thing is, if that one person is tweeting as the Sheffield Steelers, then that goes across as the Sheffield Steelers. And Steelers are doing some great things. I mean, they, they got a crown of, I think, 6,000 on Saturday night for a Challenge Cup game where they had already qualified. <laughs> So that's magnificent. They are getting some magnificent attendances in, in this early season, and all credit to them. They're doing some great stuff. They've got a good team. A um, little bit inconsistent, may, maybe, but very entertaining for, to watch from all accounts. And I just don't understand why they seem to have this obsession with the Panthers tweeting that thing out. Now, I am not naive enough to think if Panthers had, had, had done the same thing if Steelers had lost or when Steelers had lost it, there wouldn't be Panthers fans who would lap that sort of thing up. Of course they would. But Panthers wouldn't tweet that out. And I don't think any of the other eight elite league clubs would tweet that out either. And I just think it it, it makes makes it look a bit amateur. It makes the league look a bit amateur. It makes the clubs look a bit amateur because they don't need to be. Sheffield are doing such a brilliant job. Why why do they need to sort of go to that level? It, it, to me, it's a they're a big club, but that's a bit of a small club mentality by tweeting that sort of thing out, because it, it it shows that the Panthers are a bit in their heads. Well, why? They shouldn't be, because they're doing such a great job, job as it is, the Steelers. So why do they need to do that? Um, they seem to be putting out plenty of stuff on tube with Bob West. Oh, yeah, I've seen seen a few a few bits that have gone out. I just, I just don't get it. I don't get, I don't get the mentality of when, why they do it when they've got so many can tweet out, or, or they could, which they should, but they don't seem to as much. But one thing that that was um, noticeable is, is when I tweeted, tweeted about it to say how hilarious it was, a lot of Sheffield fans came back and, and said that it's, it's embarrassing and it shouldn't happen. And no, it shouldn't because it makes it makes them look bad and it makes them look a bit petty and, and, and immature when they don't need to be because they're doing such a good job uh, and, and getting some great crowds in, you know, concentrate on the positives, you know, don't, don't worry about what your nearest rivals are doing because they they are 
they <laughs> because I can assure you that Panthers certainly won't be that bothered about what you're doing. And so are kind of setting themselves up for a big upset. Yes, they certainly are. Um, but obviously they're they're probably a bit stung after Panthers beat them the last time they played them in overtime. But you know, he's just like, stop it. It really doesn't need to happen. Okay, any more questions before I go? Because for 40 minutes I'm going. I thought it would be longer than 40 minutes with all the, the dot stuck stuff. Oh, wait a minute, there was one more question. I th- yes, I thought I'd see one. Uh, from uh, HockeyFan654321, who is a regular contributor uh, this season, and he says, have you seen an ending as exciting in the Elite League as the one in the Guildford-Manchester game on Sunday night? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, Early this season in February, uh, the Nottingham Lions against the Sheffield Scimitars. It was the first game back after the the long layoff. So the first game I commentated on in in, in a year. Um, And there were three goals in the last minute. It went from 4-3 Scimitars to 4-4 to 5-4 Scimitars to Lions equalising with 12 seconds left on the clock. Um, I was losing it quite substantially on commentary because I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Uh, And then Jack Hopkins on his debut uh, for the Lions scored the overtime winner. Uh, Absolutely stunning, stunning finish to a game. So, yes, I have seen an ending more exciting than that. But for those that don't know, uh, there was an empty net. Robert Lakovic um, missed the empty net when it looked easier to score and Manchester went straight up to the other, the other end and, and equalised 5-5 five, five, uh, with, I think, a second left on the clock. Uh, and then, But Guildford did go on to win it in overtime after all that. But a, a very exciting finish to that game. But to answer the question that came in, yes, I have seen a, uh, a game more exciting than that one, and it was earlier well, earlier this year in February. Okay, any more questions? Uh, did I catch the lines on Sunday? How good was Tom Brown with two penalty shots? So, no, I didn't. Um, what was I doing Sunday? What was I doing Sunday? I was working Sunday, which is why why I didn't catch it. Um, so uh, yes, I was uh, I was doing. Junior boxing or the English Junior Boxing National Championships in Hereford. Uh, so unfortunately, I didn't see any of the Lions game on Sunday. So uh, I, I heard about it. Chris Gadsby was sort of messaging me <laughs> th- throughout it to say what was happening that um, t- Lions had missed two penalty shots and uh, the f- f- four breakaways foiled. So yeah. Not uh, not to the great, not to the greatest. Um, okay, any more questions? Mark Rackham says, just because he's one of my favourite players, is Scott Conway going to be a lock for Great Britain's World Championship roster next year? I'm not surprised to see him putting up a ton, ton of offence. I'd be incredibly surprised if he's not. After the way he played on Friday night, brilliant. Uh, but uh, I've, I saw him play for Great Britain in that Olympic qualifiers, as 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 you did yourself, Mark, and we. we we know what a, what a great tournament he had there. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I would say he's a lot for the World Championship roster next season. Um, I would I would think uh, very much at the forefront of Pete Russell's thoughts. I would think uh, at this point, especially after the start to the season he's made. So yes, definitely. Okay, I think I'm going to leave it there as we're coming up to 45 minutes. As ever, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Uh, Great to have your interaction on the chat. That's what makes it. Um, It saves me from just talking to myself uh, for for, uh, minutes on end. Uh, If I could ask a favour for those still watching, if you you could could tweet it or retweet it from my Twitter account so uh, more people can watch it. That would be absolutely fantastic. And just a reminder that I'll be back next week, probably on Tuesday. Uh, so if you do have any questions throughout the, the week at John O'Bullard on Twitter, uh, DMs are open if you if you want to uh, send them by DM. That's absolutely fine as well. Uh, but for oh, one more, how are Glasgow going to get going when all the other teams will be by then will yeah it will be hard going for Glasgow I have no doubt about that I think they start this weekend away to Belfast and 
not exactly the easiest start for them. Um, but, you know, th- they are going to have to get up to speed pretty quickly and they're going to have a huge amount of fixture congestion because they've got all their league games to fit in between now and the end of the season. So I think it's going to be tough for the Glasgow clan this season, but we, we shall see how they do. They may surprise us all. Yeah. OK, on that note, I am going to leave it. So th- once again, thank you so much for joining me. Have a great rest of the week and enjoy your hockey wherever you're watching it this weekend. But. Thanks so much for joining me and I will speak to you again very, very soon. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.